Welcome back to the lecture series based upon the textbook Linear Algebra Done Openly. As always, I am your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Uh, in this section, we are going to talk about, well, we're in section 6.3, and we're talking about this seemingly made-up word diagonalization and when a matrix is di diagonalizable, right? Um, I would caution you before you start trying to play those tiles down in the game Scrabble, you verify whether your dictionary includes this word or not, but it's a perfectly acceptable word in linear algebra here. Uh, a matrix we say is diagonalizable when it's similar to a diagonal matrix. We'll talk about that in a little bit more. Uh, but the idea of diagonalization is very closely related to the existence of a so-called eigenbasis. Is there a basis for a vector space that can be comprised only of eigenvectors for a specific matrix A? So we have some matrix A, which is N by N. And can we construct a, linear, a, a set of linear dependent eigenvectors? So we're going to be interested in what, what conditions can we guarantee independence between eigenvectors? And there is a special case for which independence is guaranteed. If we have, say, R eigenvectors, x1, x2, x3, up to xr, these are eigenvectors of the matrix A, and these correspond to distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, up to lambda r. So what we're saying here is that A times the vector x1 is just equal to lambda 1x, and uh, also A times x2 is equal to lambda 2x2. So it's, that's, again, we're an eigenvector, eigenvalue there. A x3 equals lambda 3 x3. You get the idea here. Continue on to the end of the list. Um, so we have eigenvectors, and these are associated to different eigenvalues. So lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2, which is not equal to lambda 3. Proceed until we get to the end of the list. Under this circumstance, we actually can guarantee that eigenvectors associated to different eigenvalues are going to be linearly independent. And how do we do that? Uh, the proof... The proof here uh, uses a mathematical concept known as mathematical induction. Uh, and the idea is basically the following. You start off with a so-called base case. Uh, is it ever true? Is there a simple case where it is true? And for this situation, a base case, well, we could say that, well, if you have a single eigenvector, if you have a single eigenvector, this set is linearly independent. Because after all, a set of one vectors is independent if and only if it's non-zero. And eigenvectors are not allowed to be zero. So we do get that it is it is independent sometime. And admittedly, I might even start off with, you could do the empty set, right? If you have no eigenvectors, r equals zero in that case. That, would, that also would act as a base case right here. But it feels a little bit more natural. Uh, well, maybe for from for, for those somewhat very early to linear algebra, it might feel a little bit more natural to start with r equals 1. So you have this base case. And so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to be like, okay, if it's true for x, if we're r equals 1, then we could proceed to show it's true for r equals 2, and then proceed to show it's true for r equals 3. Then we do that and that, and now we just kind of pretend you down this, this progression um, until it's like, okay, so let's assume, assume it is true up to um, just some specific value k, right? So, we, so we've proven it's true for 1, for r equals 2, 3, 4, 5, up to some value r equals k. So let's consider then the next iteration then. Um, consider, consider the case where we have x1, x2, up to x, k plus 1, many eigenvectors. So what, that, what happens in that case? Well, if we're interested if something is linearly independent or not, we look at the homogeneous system. So we want to consider C1, X1, plus C2, X2, and we take this sum all the way up to C, K plus 1, X, K plus 1. And suppose this is equal to 0. So we want to consider this equation right here. If the set of vectors is linearly dependent, then there should be only the trivial solution to this homogeneous system of equations. Well, taking this equation, let's first multiply it by the matrix A. So we multiply everything on the left-hand side, C1, X1, all the way up to uh, C, K1, X1, K, 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 X, sorry, X, K1 right there. And then on the right-hand side, we times A0 right there. Well, the right-hand side is pretty easy to, to deal with, right? We're going to end up with a 0 right there. But also on the left, we can distribute this A 
onto each of the pieces in this term. And so you're going to get a times x, where all of those x's are different eigenvectors. And so when you times the eigenvector by the matrix, it's the same thing by times in that scalar. c1, lambda 1, x1. And then you're going to get c2, lambda 2, x2, right? And this pattern continues up until we get to ck plus 1, uh, lambda, need a little bit more space there. Whoops, lambda died. Lambda k plus 1, x k plus 1. And this is equal to 0. So make notice of this equation right here. We're going to come back to it in just a second. Um, also, so, so if we take the original equation right here and we times everything by a, a bunch of these lambdas pop up everywhere. Also, what we could do is we could take the original equation and we can multiply everything by lambda k plus 1. Oh, that's poor penmanship. k plus 1. We're going to times that by all of these ones. cx1 all the way up to uh, ck1x k plus 1. Lambda k plus 1 times the zero vector. Well, on the left-hand side, we can distribute the lambdas. So we get these lambdas and distribute all, all the pieces. And so we're going to get c1 lambda k plus 1 x1. Uh, we're going to end up with a c2 lambda k plus 1 x2. And this will then continue on until you get to the end. ck plus 1 lambda k plus 1 x k plus 1 like so and this equals the zero vector right there and so we're going to put a green star next to this one and so i want you to compare these two start equations right here and in fact let's subtract them uh, let's take yellow star minus green star what's going to happen in that situation well you can combine like terms you can combine the x ones together and when you combine the x ones together, you're going to get c1 times lambda 1 minus lambda k plus 1 times x1. And then you're going to do the next one. You're going to get c2 times lambda 2 minus lambda k plus 1. Like so, you're going to get x2 right here. And then you continue on down this pattern uh, until you end up with some ck. And then you're going to get lambda k minus lambda k plus 1, x, k. And then the last term, you're going to get a ck plus 1 times lambda k plus 1 minus lambda k plus 1 times x, k plus 1. And this should all equal 0. All right, so now we've reached the point where we can actually sort of benefit from the ingenuity of how we constructed this argument here. You'll notice this very last term. We have this k, or lambda k, and k plus one minus lambda k plus one. That's the same number, that's gonna cancel out. So this whole last term disappears in the sum. And so looking at the left-hand side, we now have, we have a multiple of x plus one plus a multiple of x plus two, all the way up to a multiple of x plus k that equals zero. Now, by the, by the assumptions we've said already, it's like, oh, we've already shown that x1 up to xk, that set is linearly independent. We've already established that. Because remember, we went from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. We did up to k. So this is an independent set. So the only way that this set can combine to be 0, this would imply that each of these coefficients, ci times lambda 1, or lambda i should say, minus lambda k plus 1, this equals zero. The only way an independent set can combine to give you zero is if all the coefficients were zero themselves. Now by the zero product property, uh, if this thing is zero, if this product is zero, this would imply that either ci equals zero, or this would imply that lambda i equals lambda i plus one. Uh, th that's because lambda i minus lambda i k plus 1 would equal 0, you move to the other side. And this possibility is not possible, remember, because we are assuming that all of these eigenvalues are distinct. So by dis since they're distinct, that, pro that factor is not 0. So it must have been all of the original factors were 0 as well. So come back up to this equation right here. We had this dependence relationship. We had this dependence relationship on our vectors right here. It had to be that c1, c2, ck are all 0. So we get a 0 
zero, all the way up to this. So all of the coefficients are zero, and this would then tell us that ck plus one times xk plus one is likewise zero, because everything else went to zero. But how can these all be zero as well? Well, this, this would happen only if, again, using that sort of zero product property here, we're getting that either ck plus one equals zero or xk plus one equals zero which the second possibility is not possible because eigenvectors can't equal zero. So we've now established that every coefficient in this linear combination must have been zero. And this establishes the fact that, okay, if, if x1 up to xk is linear independent, that will imply that x1 up to xk plus one is gonna be independent as well. And so as this pattern continues, like a string of infinite dominoes, as one domino falls and next, the next, it knocks over the next domino, the next domino, the next domino, and we can see that all these, if we have a set of, of a set of eigenvectors associated to distinct eigenvalues, that set of vectors is necessarily going to be um, linear independent. And we're gonna use this in our forthcoming discussion about eigenvectors and um, eigenbases more specifically.